I am very excited to welcome Nell Irvin Painter to Harvard Bookstore tonight to discuss her new book, The History of White People. The Edwards Professor of American History Emerita at Princeton, uh, Professor Painter is the author of five previous books, including Creating Black Americans and Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol. Professor Painter is a counselor of the Society of American Historians and a former president of both the Southern Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians. Uh, and she is currently pursuing her MFA in painting at the Rhode Island School of Design. In Professor Painter's newest book uh, examines the evolution of the concept of a white race. The history of white people shows how the definition and significance of whiteness has changed from ancient Greece to modern times and the effects of this shifting notion with particular attention to the impact of whiteness in America. The New York Times called the history of white people an intellectual history with much to teach everyone, and the San Francisco Chronicle called the book perhaps the definitive story of a most curious adjective, a scholarly, non-polemical masterpiece. And please join me in welcoming Nell Irvin Painter. Well, this really is a pleasure to see so many familiar faces uh, and to see the youth. <laughs> what I'd like to do is uh, read to you for about uh, 17 minutes, and then we'll talk. Actually, I think I'll just read the whole book. <laughs> we'll start with the introduction. I might have entitled this book, Constructions of White Americans from Antiquity to the Present, because it explores a concept that lies within a history of events. I have chosen this strategy because race is an idea, not a fact, and its questions demand answers from the conceptual rather than the factual realm. American history offers up a large bounty of commentary on what it means to be non-white, moving easily between alterations in the meaning of race as color, from colored to Negro to Afro-American to black to African-American, always associating the notion of blackness with slavery. But little attention has been paid to history's equally confused and flexible discourses on the white races and the old, old slave trade from Eastern Europe. I use white races in the plural because for most of the past centuries, when race really came down to matters of law, educated Americans believed in the existence of more than one European race. It is possible imp and important to investigate that other side of history without trivializing the history we already know so well. Let me state categorically that while this is not a history in white versus black, I do not by any means underestimate or ignore the overwhelming importance of black race in America. I am familiar with the truly gigantic literature that explains the meaning, importance, and honest-to-God reality of race when it means black. In comparison with this preoccupation, statutory and biological definitions of white race remain notoriously vague, the leavings of what is not black. But this vagueness does not indicate lack of interest. To the contrary, for another vast historical literature, much less known today, explains the meaning, importance, and honest-to-God reality of the existence of white races. It may seem odd to begin a book on Americans in antiquity, a period long before Europeans discovered the Western Hemisphere and thousands of years before the invention of the concept of race. But given the prevalence of the notion that race is permanent, many believe it possible to trace something recognizable as the white race back more than 2,000 years. In addition, not a few Westerners have attempted to racialize antiquity, making ancient history into white race history 
and classics into a lily white field complete with pictures of blonde ancient Greeks. How many of you know that uh, John Singer Sargent mural in the Museum of Art here in Boston with the blonde Apollo and the blonde horses? The blonde ancient Greek narrative may no longer be taught in schools, but it lives on as a myth to be confronted in these pages. Before launching the trip back to ancient times, however, it might be useful to make a few remarks about the role of science or science of race. I resist the temptation to place the word science, even theories and uh, assertions of the most spurious, pernicious, or ridiculous kind in quotation marks. For the task of deciding what is sound science and what is cultural fantasy would surely, it would uh, quickly become all consuming. Better to note the qualifications of yesterday's scientists than to brand as mere science their thought that has not stood the test of time. I give scholars of repute in their day pride of place in my pages no matter that some of their thinking has fallen by the wayside. Today we think of race as a matter of biology, but a second thought reminds us that the meanings of race quickly spill out of merely physical categories. Even in so circumscribed a place as one book, the meanings of white race reach into concepts of labor, gender, and class, and images of personal beauty that seldom appear in analyses of race. Work plays a central part in race talk because the people who do the work are likely to be figured as inherently deserving the toil and poverty of laboring status. It is still assumed, wrongly, that slavery anywhere in the world must rest on a foundation of racial difference. Time and again, the better classes have concluded that those people deserve their lot. It must be something within them. Uh, excuse me, it must be something within them that puts them at the bottom. In modern times, we recognize, recognize this kind of reasoning as it relates to black race. But in other times, the same logic was applied to people who were white, especially when they were impoverished immigrants seeking work. Those at the very bottom were slaves. Slavery has helped construct concepts of white race in two contradictory ways. First, American tradition equates whiteness with freedom while consigning blackness to slavery. The history of unfree white people slumbers in popular forgetfulness, though white slavery, like black slavery, moved people around and mixed up human genes on a massive scale. The important demographic role of the various slave trades is all too often overlooked as a historical force. In the second place, the term Caucasian as a designation for white people originates in concepts of beauty related to the white slave trade from Eastern Europe. And whiteness remains embedded in visions of beauty found in art history and popular culture. Today, most Americans envision whiteness as racially indivisible, though ethnically divided. This is the scheme anthropologists laid out in the mid-20th century. By this reckoning, there were only three real races. Mongoloid, Negroid, and Caucasoid. The oid makes it sound scientific. <laughs> but countless ethnicities. Today, however, biologists and geneticists, not to mention literary critics, no longer believe in the physical existence of races, though they recognize the continuing power of racism, the belief that races exist and that some are better than others. It took some two centuries to reach this conclusion after countless racial schemes had spun out countless different numbers of races, even of white races, and attempts at classification produce frustration. Although science today denies race any standing as objective truth, 
and the U.S. Census faces taxonomic meltdown, many Americans cling to race as the unschooled cling to superstition. So long as racial discrimination remains a fact of life and statistics can be arranged to support racial difference, the American belief in races will endure. But confronted with the actually existing American population, its distribution of wealth, power, and beauty, the notion of American whiteness will continue to evolve as it has since the creation of the American Republic. Chapter one, <laughs> Greeks and Scythians. Were there white people in antiquity? Certainly some believe so, as though categories we use today could be read backwards over the millennia. People with light skin certainly existed well before our own times, but did anybody think they were white or that their character related to their color? No. For neither the idea of race nor the idea of white people had been invented, and people's skin color did not carry useful meaning. What mattered was where they lived. Were their lands damp or dry? Were they virile or prone to impotence? Were they hard or soft? Could they be seduced by the luxuries of civilized society, or were they warriors through and through? What were their habits of life? Rather than as white people, Northern Europeans were known by vague tribal names, Scythians and Celts, then Gauls and Germani. But if one asks, say, who were the Scythians? The question sets us off down a slippery slope, for over time, and especially in earliest times, any search for the ancestors of white Americans perforce leads back to non-literate peoples who left no documents describing themselves. Thus, we must shift through the intellectual history Americans claim as Westerners, keeping in mind that long before um, science dictated the terms of human difference as race, long before racial scientists began to measure heads and concoct racial theory, ancient Greeks and Romans had their own means of describing the peoples of their world as they knew it more than two millennia year, uh, more than two millennia ago. And inevitably, the earliest accounts of our story are told from on high by rulers dominant at a particular time. Power affixes the markers of history. Furthermore, any attempt to trace biological ancestry quickly turns into legend for human beings have multiplied so rapidly by 1,000 or more times in some 200 years and by more than 32,000 times in 300 years. Evolutionary biologists now reckon that the six to seven billion people now living share the same small number of ancestors living two or 3,000 years ago. These circumstances make nonsense of anybody's pretensions to find a pure racial ancestry. Nor are notions of Western cultural purity any less spurious. Without a doubt, the sophisticated Egyptian, Phoenician, Minoan, and Persian societies deeply influenced the classical culture of ancient Greece, which some still imagine as the West's pure and unique source. That story is still to come, for the obsession with purity racial and cultural arose many centuries after the demise of the ancients. Now close your eyes while I read really fast and get you to the back of the book. <laughs> Chapter 28. <laughs> I thought I'd never finish this book. <laughs> the fourth enlargement of American whiteness. Agitating and media dominating as America's civil rights and black power movements were, most of the country's white people might have doubted that the upheaval had much to do with them. They might well have thought that they were individuals who had succeeded by themselves and that race had always meant black people who had not. <laughs> 
In fact, by the 1960s, the whole races of Europe discourse had fallen completely out of fashion. Now, while you had your eyes closed and I was reading really fast, we went through the races of Europe part, which is uh, late 19th century, uh, the first quarter of the 20th century, a very important part because it shaped uh, federal uh, legislation dealing with immigration. Books such as William Z. Ripley's Races of Europe, published 1899, once a central reading on race, were now remaindered as useless. And in fact, I own a copy of this book, which comes from the Lowell Public Library. And on the title page is a big stamp, and it says, discarded. <laughs> And if you were not Jewish, calling Jews a race would send you straight into the anti-Semitic column. Reminders that Jews and Italians had been labeled as races a generation earlier might have prompted a retort that race was used more loosely in the past. This is true. But every use of race has always been loose, whether applied to black, white, yellow, brown, red, or other. No consensus has ever formed on the number of human races or even on the number of white races. Criteria constantly shift according to individual taste and political need. It was clear, however, that in the olden days, that is to say the 20th century, <laughs> in the olden days, Jim Crow had kept the colored races apart from whites and African Americans largely hidden behind segregation's veil. Shortly after the end of the Second World War, the end of legalized segregation began to propel black people into national visibility as never before. Concurrently, other changes were soon to deeply alter American sense of the very meanings of race. Little noticed at the time, the openness of the mid-1960s went well beyond the black-white color line. The Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, the Hart-Celler Act, was specifically crafted to counter earlier Nordic-minded immigration statutes, especially in terms of Asians. It also allowed for wider immigration from the Western Hemisphere and from Africa. Therein lay the seeds of demographic revolution. New, new immigrants of the post-1965 era overwhelmingly from outside Europe were upending American racial conventions. Asians, greatly rising in number, were rapidly being judged to be smarter and eventually to be richer than native-born whites. Latinos formed 13% of the population by 2000, edging out African Americans as the most numerous minority. The U.S. Census, without peer in scoring the nation's racial makeup, had begun to notice Latin Americans in the 1940s by counting up heterogeneous peoples with Spanish surnames and hastily lumping them together as Hispanics. Though an impossibly crude measurement, it survived until 1977. By that point, the federal government needed more precise racial statistics to enforce civil rights legislation. To this end, the Office of Management and Budget issued Statistical, uh, Statistical Policy Directive Number 15. Here was a change worth noting. In the racially charged decades of the early 20th century, governments at all levels had passed laws to separate Americans by race. <coughs> Though Jim Crow segregation was supposed to be separate but equal, in practice it worked to discriminate by excluding non-whites from the public sphere, from public institutions, whether from libraries, schools, swimming pools, or the ballot box. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 began to change all that, so that by the late 20th century, the rationale for counting people by race had morphed into a means of keeping track of civil rights enforcement. Statistical Policy Directive Number 15 set the terms for racial and ethnic classification throughout American society. 
by directing federal agencies, including the U.S. Census, to collect data according to four races, black, white, American Indian slash, slash Alaska Native, and Asian Pacific Islander. Hawaiian was added later as a concession to protest, so if you protest you, enough, you can get your race in the census. <laughs> People often ask me, you know, why do we have just these ones? You know, make a lot of ruckus and get another one. <laughs> you could get one for Cambridge. <laughs> Uh, let's see, there was also one ethnic category, Hispanic Latino, which is not racial. Elaboration was good for civil rights, but it opened the way to chaos. Under these guidelines, the Hispanic Latino classification pretended enormous turmoil. Now that there was a non-Hispanic white category, did there not also exist Hispanic white people? Yes, no, and other. <laughs> But just think if you were in trying to deal with a census. Faced with the given racial choices on the census of 2000, fully 42.2% of Latinos checked some other race rather than black or white, throwing nearly 6% of Americans into a kind of racial limbo. In addition, the U.S. Census of 2000 had to increase, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a deeper and more personal recognition of multiracial identities. For the first time, respondents were allowed to describe themselves as belonging to one or more <coughs> of 15 racial identities. As so often in the past, and adding confusion, the list of races included nationalities. And there's a picture <coughs> of question six from the, oh, thank you, but I can't because I'll. See <laughs> <laughs> um, figure 28-1, question six from the U.S. Census of 2000. This expansion now allowed for 126 ethno-racial groups or for purists, 63 races. <clears throat> it did not take much analytical ability to see that any notion of race lay so diluted as to lose much of its punch. And taxonomy was rapidly buckling much further under the weight of interracial sex. Somebody complained to me recently that my book has a lot of sex in it. <laughs> and it does, that's what people do. <laughs> You know, you don't notice sex if the children, you know, just are neutral. People notice sex if the children are obviously mixed race children. So if you have a mixed race child, it's like, oh, you have sex. <laughs> <clears throat> so there's nothing new here. Americans' disorderly sexual habits have always overflowed neat racial lines and driven race thinkers crazy. Asians and Native American Indians had the highest rates of interracial marriage, but others, including African Americans, now often married and had children with people from outside their racial ethnic group. By 1990, American families were so heterogeneous that one-seventh of whites, one-third of blacks, Four-fifths of Asians and 19 twentieths of Native American Indians were closely related to someone of a different racial group. With some 12 percent of young people now calling themselves multiracial, it is expected that by 2050, 10 percent of whites and blacks and more than 50 percent of Latinos, Asians, and Native American Indians will be married to someone outside their racial group. With so many non-white and white Americans marrying willy-nilly, the, the barriers between the progeny of European immigrants have largely disappeared. Among white people, three out of four marriages had already crossed ethnic boundaries by 1980. A generation later, very few white Americans had four grandparents from the same country. Uh, 
Krevker's European-derived American, this new man, and this also goes to the part you heard while I was reading really fast, um, had arrived. William Z. Ripley had predicted this outcome in 1908, fearing, above all, the inharmonious mixing of Italian men and Irish women. <laughs> But he would have been forced to reconsider his prediction that such a racial mix would make Americans ugly. We have already seen the lowering of racial boundaries starting in the 1940s when ethnic began replacing race as applied to the descendants of European immigrants. The use of racial groups for white people has become a moribund category, too, partly because white people are so mixed up. Finally, the perquisites of mere whiteness count for less in the present situation, while the stigma of blackness, once just one drop sufficed to curse the white-looking individual, also seems less mortal. Any of you remember um, the movies where the white-looking woman, she's really beautiful and she's living a nice life and a nice guy doctor falls in love with her? And then it turns out she has one drop of black blood in her life. You remember that? Do you think that would happen now? Back in the 20th century, white people were soon to be rich, or at least middle class, as well as more beautiful, powerful, and smart. Did I hear a snort? <laughs> as citizens and scholars, they said what was needed to be known and monopolized the study of other people with themselves hardly being marked or scrutinized in return. Think of Francis Amasa Walker and William Z. Ripley, for whom formal education, New England ancestry, and useful connections assured authority. Half a century later, the upheaval of the civil rights turned the looking glass around, bringing white people under scrutiny. Think of Malcolm X and James Baldwin. Today, the attractive qualities that Saxons, Anglo-Saxons, Nordics, and Whites were assumed to monopolize are also to be found elsewhere. After a string of non-white Mrs. America, Jennifer Lopez and Beyonce Knowles are celebrated as Hollywood beauties, Vijay Singh, Tiger Woods, and the Williams sisters, <laughs> Venus and Serena, dominate elite sports. Robert Johnson, founder of the BET Network, Bill Cosby, and the financier Alphonse Fletcher Jr. have made millions. Oprah Winfrey is rich and famous. Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice have been secretaries of state, and Alberto Gonzalez, attorney general. Even more to the point of uniting power and beauty, Barack Obama is president of the United States. First Lady Michelle Obama whose skin color alone would have condemned her to ugliness in the 20th century, figures as an icon of beauty and intelligence on the global stage. None of these individuals is white, but being white these days is not what it used to be. <laughs> Thus, it is sensible to conclude that the American is undergoing a fourth great enlargement. Although race may still seem overweening, Without legal recognition, it is less important than in the past. The dark of skin, who also happen to be rich, say people of South Asian, African American, and Hispanic background, and the light of skin from anywhere, who are beautiful, are now well on the way to inclusion. Is this the end of race in America? At the turn of the 21st century, it was starting to look that way. In 1997, the American Association of Physical Anthropologists urged the American government to phase out the use of race as a data category and substitute ethnic categories instead. You know, I've been thinking about that. I don't think that would have made any difference at all. But you think it would have made a difference? No. Anyway, they urged it in 1997. Geneticists studying DNA, the constituent material of genes that issues instructions to our bodies in response to our surroundings, were also concluding that race as a biological category made no sense. 
The habit of relating heredity to the environment may be traced back to antiquity, but early 19th century racial thinkers turned the notion around, deeming race a permanent marker for innate superiority or inferiority. Not until the 1850s did the influence of environment on heredity get rescued with Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Darwin described a world much older than the biblical 5,000 years, reasoning that heredity was not fixed, that generation after generation, living things change in response to their surroundings. Arguments over race in the human genome have subsided of late, leaving us with some intriguing data about personal appearance. Prevailing racial schemes now rest once again on concepts of skin color, hence black people and white people. But widely recognized is the fact that not only are black people actually various shades of brown and yellow, but so too are white people, merely somewhat lighter and often with a lot more pink. As Blumenbach realized in the late 18th century, one group's skin color shades gradually into another's. There are no clearly demarcated lines. Some people who identify as black may have lighter colored skin than others who identify as white. Siblings with the same mother and father can display a range of skin colors. Race may be about pigment, but what makes people's skin light or dark? Skin color is a byproduct of two kinds of melanin, red to yellow pheomelanin and dark brown to black eumelanin in reaction to sunlight. And several genes interact to make people light or dark, reddish, brownish, or yellowish. Ancient scholars were wiser than they knew when they related skin color to climate. Today's biologists concur. Sunny climates do make people dark-skinned, and dark, cold climates make people light-skinned. How much of which sort of melanin people have in their skin, and to what degree it is expressed, depends entirely over time on exposure to the sun's ultraviolet or UV radiation. Melanin both protects against excessive ultraviolet radiation and allows sufficient UV radiation to enter the body. Too much UV radiation causes skin cancer and can lead to death. Not enough can weaken the bones. Where are we now? Mapping the human genome elicited initial proclamations of human kindredness across the globe. Then race talk inscribed racial difference on our genes. That talk has not disappeared, but ideally we would realize that human beings' short history relates us all to one another. To speak in racial terms, incessant human migration has made us all multiracial. Does this mean the human genome or civil rights or desegregation have ended the tyranny of race in America? Almost certainly not. The fundamental black-white binary endures, even though the category of whiteness, or we might say more precisely, a category of non-blackness, uh, effectively expands. As before, the black poor remain outside the concept of the American, remain as an alien race of degenerate families. And these terms, alien race and degenerate families, are terms that come up in the part of the book I read really fast uh, and have to do with poor white families. Uh, multicultural middle class may diversify the suburbs and college campuses, but the face of poor, segregated inner cities remains black. For quite some time, many observers have held that money and interracial sex would solve the race problem and indeed, in some cases, they have. Nevertheless, poverty in a dark skin endures as the opposite of whiteness, driven by an age-old social yearning to characterize the poor as permanently other and inherently inferior. And here the book ends. Thanks. This is something I don't know about. <laughs>
I, I know about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which excluded working class Asians. Uh, it allowed for diplomats and students to come briefly, but not workers. So that was the first race-based uh, Immigration Exclusion Act in American history. I also know about two cases, one in 1921 and one in 1923, of um, Ozawa, who was Japanese, who sued to naturalize because he was white. And the judges said, you may be white, but you're not Caucasian. And then Thind, uh, who sued to be naturalized as white, and said, I'm Caucasian. And they said, you may be Caucasian, but you're not white. <laughs> yeah. In a sense, the, the explosion of the importance of whiteness is uh, uniquely American, or I should say American in the larger sense of the hemisphere, based on African slavery. So the black-white dichotomy is uh, part of, it's a big part of the law of the land, but it's not all there is. You're absolutely right that uh, in Europe, the Slavs became a much more important group of people to um, racialize and keep at bay. So um, Gobineau, for instance, was worried about the Slavs. And when his uh, 1850s translators in the American South translated him, they were more worried about the blacks. And so they had to really uh, mess up what he had to say about black people. And he thought slavery was bad for the United States. They had to take that part out, too. So th the European stuff doesn't translate seamlessly. But the idea of permanent, measurable racial difference does translate though it's used for different people at different times. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be both bigger and smaller. <laughs> bigger in the sense that the Tiger Woodses of the world will be in. And when I say whiteness, I mean uh, the kind of uh, uh, the qualities, the good stuff, the things you can do, um, the power of whiteness, the beauty of whiteness. Uh, and you notice that Tiger Woods have, has gotten uglier since he got into trouble. Yeah, yeah. Just another black guy. Yeah, he used to be so beautiful and young, and now he's old and ugly. Yeah. Um, but at uh, any rate, uh, that's what sin does. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's getting bigger, but it's also getting smaller in the way that I mentioned about one, one drop, you know, is no longer enough to kill it off. So as more and more people get in, it's going to be worth less and less. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, our country is pathetically unequal in income and pathologically unequal in, in wealth. And those are the big uh, qualifiers, I think, in the world to come. 90% and 10%. <laughs> Scientific. <laughs> um, what made the alien races of the early 20th century into white people? Federal policy. Do you want more? The New Deal which mobilized uh, generations of American-born voters whose parents and grandparents were immigrants of the so-called alien races. Um, the Second World War, which needed national unity, which also reached out to black people, but uh, sought to tamp down the differences between the European races still. And so it's from that moment in the 40s that you get Negroid, Caucasoid, and Mongoloid. So there are races, but they're not the ones you thought. Um, and then uh, just as important is the uh, GI Bill, which was administered locally on purpose. So it meant that in the South, local elites could white line it. Uh, some black GIs were able to take advantage of it, but proportionally not very many. So that really gave the children or of the, the alien races an economic 
uh, step up. And then um, the Veterans Administration and the FHA's lending policies, which until the Fair Housing Act allowed for racial discrimination. So the new suburbs of the post-war era, like Levittown, were for <coughs> whites only, but they put together uh, Jews, Irish, Italian, Slavs, everybody together in the name of whiteness. And they were like 99.99.99% white. I said that it's taken on a life of its own in the United States in a way that it has not in other places. But the Europeans did use the word white. So for Linnaeus, for instance, I mean, these, pe these are people who were writing in Latin, I should say. But for Linnaeus in 1758, his, he had four different groups of people and designated them by uh, territory. So there were Europeans, Africans, um, Asians, and Americans. And then when he talked about what it was about them, he listed white, and he also listed temperament. In the 18th century with Blumenbach, later on in the 18th century with Blumenbach and his five races, um, they still have a geographic basis, but part of what makes the word Caucasian, and Blumenbach was the person who applied it to Europeans, why he used that word was because white people were the most beautiful people in the world. Mm. Aren't you glad to know that? <laughs> 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 what I find so amazing are the people who propagate these things are just ordinary looking people, right. <laughs> you know? And I had to look and look and look to try to find Caucasians and Circassians and Georgians who are supposed to be the most beautiful people in the world, when it turns out it's really Hungarians. <laughs> uh, but to find images of them, and when you find images, well, the first images you find of Caucasians are really old people who eat yogurt and live a long time. <laughs> so anyway, it's based on beauty. I think we are more class-driven now than back in the 20th century, but I think the relationship of class and race in one person's or one neighborhood's experience really has to do with that neighborhood and that experience. So I don't think there's any one answer. You remember, we're 320, 30, 40 million people, so there's no one answer. But one thing is clear, and that is that race does still count. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big issue. And um, I, if I were up to writing forever um, or another book, it might be interesting to see to what extent um, the pattern of Jewish discussion of the assimilation uh, uh, cultural uh, plurality has shown or has gone um, the, the way that black people might go. I don't know. They'll be, I think it would be really, really interesting. But what I did remember, well, you probably don't remember, but I said very quickly that calling Jews a race if you were not Jewish, because there is a discussion among Jews as to whether or not Jews are a race. And some people say yes, and some people say no, and some people say, well, yes, but don't talk about it, and some people say no, but don't talk about it. You know, so that is not a settled question among Jews. What I see in the literature is um, a gener generational shifts. So that people who are my age, born in the 40s, might have a sense of kind of being both Jewish and American but you know, not wanting to buy into white American completely. But then children being more comfortable with being white and also more prone to marry out. And then their children being even more comfortable as white. And sometimes if they have, say, one Italian parent and one Jewish parent, they will go around saying, oh, I'm Italian, kiss me, because the idea of being Italian is to be sexy and cute. So uh, it's, I, I see it changing over the generations. I, I can't generalize for everybody of every age, and it's a big enough generalization to do it just by generation. Antiquity. I did decide to go back to antiquity uh, because I felt I needed a, a longer running time. 
because it was very clear to me from the reasons you mentioned about Blumenbach that there's a big backstory that's European. So I have a chapter on Germaine de Stael, uh, who almost moved to the United States. They said, you wouldn't like it here. <laughs> you would not like it here. But uh, so I needed to do some European stuff. And the race thinkers in Europe um, tended to be pretty reactionary, uh, tended to. So um, in a, a whole part of the book that is not there has to do with Greeks, uh, ancient Greeks and Germans and Jews, actually. Uh, you know, the, it was a big theme in European race thinking, uh, connecting the ancient Greeks to the Germans, and then the Germans get connected to the Saxons, to the English, and to the Americans, and so forth. But over and over again, I saw people making arguments about permanence and about, uh, and to prove permanence going back to the ancient Greeks. So I went back to the ancient Greeks. And it was really interesting, actually. Um, I'm not sure I had read Julius Caesar's uh, War in Gaul before, certainly not carefully. And uh, it's a tremendous war story. Also learned about a lot about Vercingetorix, the uh, great um, hero of the Gauls. Yeah, so there's a lot there. Not at all, <laughs> not at all. Um, I, in fact, the idea that there are universal connotations of black and white, um, I categorically reject. Uh, what I'm finding is uh, change over time and uh, shifts in meaning. So you can only find universals if you stand way back and close all of one eye and half of another. Well, that flies in the face of the fact that light and darkness are universal conditions of our physical life. But the meanings of them change over time. They draw on those connotations. Yeah, so, so does sex difference. Uh, not of non-whiteness, but they were they were considered alien races. They were white, but they were alien races because there were more than the idea was that there was more than one white race. The social conditions that prompt ra racialization are poverty and having to do hard, dirty work for nothing or for very little, and so. Uh, the better classes want to stigmatize you and say it's your fault and it's something in you and it's permanent, so get over it. That's the second part of your question. The first part of your question about eugenics. Uh, eugenics, as I found it, came out of a discourse aimed at poor, white, largely rural families. And they were also largely Anglo-Saxon, admittedly Anglo-Saxon at the time. And the justification for sterilizing them became that they had the wrong kind of Anglo-Saxon background. So it turns out there are two kinds of Anglo-Saxons. There's the good kind, and then there's the degenerate family kind. And the degenerate family kind are people who are the descendants of the convicts and the indentured servants and the lower classes who were shipped into the colonies uh, in the 17th and 18th century. So it's still their fault. Well, you know, I, I, I think class and race off, go together, but they're not, um, it's not either or. Uh, and so you can have class privilege, but still have race problems. Uh, but you can also have class privilege that get you out of race problems. You know, there, there we're t again talking about uh, individual experience. Um, as I look around at the Tea Party stuff and the hysteria and the meanness, it reminds me actually of the early 20th century hysteria over the Southern and Eastern Europeans. And um, the place that uh, really enunciated that very clearly in the 20s was the Saturday Evening Post. And so there's a cartoon on page bloopity bloop <laughs> uh, where you find this family 
heedlessly going into the big wave, the tidal wave of immigration. And behind immigration is Bolshevism, disease, race degeneracy, and they mean white people. Um, so, you know, it's that kind of hysteria, which actually ended by closing down immigration and uh, changing the United States tremendously uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Thank you. Thank you.